said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. And today we thought as a great nation that the almighty dollar would solve the problems of the world, and we're in the biggest mess that we've ever been in. And then we need to search our own hearts. We're living for this life only. What a message, friends. Some of us need to depend on God a little bit more. Don't give anxious thought. Trust God. My, what a wonderful thing this is that he's saying to those that are his own. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God commandeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's a remarkable statement. All you have to do is call on him, friend. To call upon the Lord means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You got your Bibles? Everybody have their Bibles? We're going to be in Romans. We're going to be in Romans chapter 5. Chapter 5 as we go on, right? We again went through the wonderful, joyful time of the year. We just went through uh, celebrating the birth of our Savior. But we move on now. We move on to the scriptures. We stay consistent in who we are as Calvary Chapel, going through the Bible, right? The full counsel of God, Genesis to Revelation, book by book, chapter by chapter. Verse by verse, and we stay true to, true to that because I truly believe that, you know, if we stay true to that, God will reveal things to us that, and even if you've read Romans multiple times already, it's the same thing, I think, for all of us, that the more you stay in it, the more God reveals to us. And if you open your heart, 
because that's where things have to come to your heart, right? Because here, here, you know, you read the Bible, and sometimes your, your, your brain gets in a way. We just have to let the, our heart be open. That's why I pray right now. Let's pray before we get into the Word. I pray, Father God, Lord, that this morning we open our hearts to your Word, Lord, the Scripture that you have given us, Lord, this morning through Paul during the time of his walking on this earth, Lord, that you gave him these revelations, Lord, that to reveal to us these doctrines, Lord, that we can stand by these foundational things, Lord, that we have seen so far, that these foundational things that we can stand on, that they're true and they're without error. But for us to remain in faith, that they are true so that they can be written in our hearts, Lord, and receive them that way. And that's what I pray this morning, that this, this well, the word of God this morning will be that you've given us will be written on people's hearts, my brothers' and sisters' hearts this morning, individually and as a group, Lord, so that when we walk out of here, and I always pray this, Lord, that we're a little different, whatever that means for each one of us, Lord, and I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. So in this chapter 5, as we've, we've, we're going to start in, today in, chap, in verse 11, and one of the things you'll see here, and I think this is probably one of the, when I talk about foundational things, uh, and some of the things we've already we've gone through and some of the foundational things we've seen are this right we've seen these words and these are very important doctrines if you will for Christians for followers of Jesus right we saw that we are what are what are we if we are followers of Jesus and we receive him in faith we are justified right we're justified that word we're justified in faith right it has to be always in faith and that word justification is very important because once we're justified in our faith and believing in who Jesus was, who uh, went to the cross and died for your sin, my sin, for the world's sin. Now we, we believe that in our heart, that he was resurrected, he rose from the grave, and he walked this earth, and then he was ascended to the Father. If we can believe that, we are justified in our faith, we believe that in our heart, we can now stand before Father God in what? righteousness you see very important thing you and I could never stand before God like well if you're someone that's not a follower of Jesus if you're not justified in faith you could never stand before God because God is a just God God is a fair God and through that righteousness now that being justified by faith through that righteousness we can stand before God we can have a relationship so Paul moves on from that now and he comes into this, these next end closing verses of chapter 5. And I picked out this word because I think it's probably, well, probably the most important verse, uh, the most important word in these verses that we go through 11 through 21. And the word is reconciliation. Okay? So you have justified, justification, justification by faith. Then you are declared righteous before God. Why? because you have been now reconciled. And let's see, and you'll see in this scripture, in verse 11, you'll see that word reconciliation, but it's mentioned, reconciliation is mentioned six times in the Bible, right? Then I'll, I'll give you some of the verses. In Matthew chapter 5, 24, it says, leave thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. And then Romans, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11, he says, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried and be reconciled. See, we, we, we can associate reconciliation a lot of times with marriage. People going through some tough times in marriage, they sometimes filed for divorce because of what? Irreconcilable differences. Well, here God says, I'm going to take this and I'm going to reconcile you because you you are irreconcilable as a sinner. And he uses this word reconciliation, and it's really kind of, the, the Greek word is katalasso. I hope I'm saying that right, katalasso. And it means to change mutually, right? To change mutually. And it's, uh, it's, it's a really the most important thing is a divine work in our in our spirits a divine work of redemption that's what it is it's redemption right i was talking to someone this morning i said our redemption draws near well only because we're reconciled because of what jesus did on the cross right so that demonstrates that god so far has taken upon himself our sin right and has become an atonement and that has reconciled our relationship because what we'll see in these verses of what Adam, you know Adam, what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. 
Because that's where it all began. That's where this whole story all began, right? So we see in Romans 5 here, we, what have we learned so far in Romans 5? That this, a true, remember this? What is a true Christian? A true Christian will always rejoice, right? And we've talked about that. We said, oh, that's kind of hard sometimes to rejoice all the time. But here, we're looking at a whole different aspect of what that word rejoice means. And he says three times in this chapter, we're given the reasons for rejoicing as believers, right? First, we rejoice in our spiritual position. Oh, that should be a good thing. Your spiritual position, you should rejoice in that and who you are in Christ Jesus. You should always be rejoicing in that, even when things are really tough, because no matter what happens to you, you're going to be okay. That's a good thing to rejoice in because of who you are, your spiritual spiritual position. We should always be rejoicing in that, in who we are in Christ Jesus. And then having been justified by faith, is what we just talked about, we have peace. Remember that? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's always going to be, that's where the peace is going to come, right? And we have, how do we have access to that? We have access to that faith by God's grace to us. The gift, the unmerited gift, right? The gift that God gives us, Jesus Christ. That's where we stand this morning. That's where you and I stand this morning. And we rejoice, and I pray you do, you rejoice in this hope. Because this is, what, hey, look, this life, you got to have hope. you got to have some hope, no matter what it is here. But God says here, rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. That's what you rejoice in. And that's where your hope is. Your hope is in the glory of God, that one day you'll be with God in heaven. See, that is our spiritual position. Believe that this morning. That's your spiritual position. And the moment we believe, that moment we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can rejoice. I pray you rejoice this morning in the hope of sharing the glory of God. These are really important things to keep in your heart as we go forward in this year to keep you going, to keep you moving forward in this life. And then we're, and then we're told to rejoice in growing in to be more like Jesus, right? Conformity. But to be, if there's one thing you want to conform to, it's to conform to the character of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So we rejoice in that. Rejoice in the growing. And I pray you're growing. I pray you're growing as a Christian. You know, not that you become this great theologian. Maybe somebody would be. I don't know. But that you grow in your faith. That you grow stronger. That you can tell other people of your hope. That's what this is all about, too, you know. That we can tell people our hope. When you know a lot of people that are struggling, going through a lot of different things, and sometimes we do, but we know that hope that we become more like Jesus, right? And sometimes becoming more like Jesus is, is, is not an easy thing because a lot of this life you know, is produced. There's a lot of things that we suffer through, right? Don't we suffer through a lot of things in this life sometimes? But here's what I'll say to you, and I, maybe you've gone through this already in your spirit, in your heart, in your mind, that suffering helps us to become more like Jesus. Does that make sense? And as we suffer sometimes, we're, we know that this, as you suffer, as you're going to suffer, and I pray that whatever it is, know this in your heart, that you're protected in a way that a non-believer is not protected. We're protected and covered by the love of God. No matter what happens to you, the love of God is on you. The love of God is with you. And we learn to rejoice in our sufferings. Maybe you can have a testimony and tell someone, another person, of some of the things that you've gone through in this life, some of the hard things in this life. Whatever it may be, you can make a list of what they, each, for each one of us, I'm sure. But you can tell them of your hope and why you rejoice. And they'll say, wow, you went through that and you're suffering. And how did you get through that? Well, the Lord Jesus got me through it. You know, those are great times to have a, a, a place of witnessing. And sometimes God will put you in those places. And I pray he does going forward in this year. Right? We learn to rejoice in our sufferings, as hard as that may be. Right? So look, verses 11 to 21, which is where we're going to be this morning, we learn to rejoice in this, in our great and glorious God. Amen. Right? He says, not only this, not only is this so, Paul has said this twice in this chapter. Paul has said this twice in this chapter, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's through whom we have now received, where he says here in verse 11, look at verse 11, he says, we have now received the reconciliation. There's the word, reconciliation. That's a restoration. You've been restored to God's favor. You see, before that, you, before you've come to Christ, 
Before you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you were not restored, by the way. Now you come before God in restoration in his favor now. And Christians, we always have a grounds for rejoicing. I believe that in my heart. No matter what happens, you have a ground for rejoicing. And three kinds of rejoicing are described in chapter 5. And they represent, you know what they represent, those three kinds of rejoicing? They represent maturity, levels of maturity. How you're walking, how you're moving forward in this walk with Christ. Right? It's maturity. And this levels of how you understand the truth that you're holding in your hands. And how do you understand that? And each one of us is different. Each one of us receive it different, I truly believe. And then when we come together, we rejoice in that fact that we are finding out that we're all moving at different... We may not be all in the same place mature-wise as followers of Christ, but we all are followers of Christ. And we can all uplift each other and carry each other as we go through these different things or sufferings in life, right? And then how you respond to the different truths in that book. See, each one of us, and I have seen this, someone could give you a scripture and you could say something and you believe that's the truth and they say, well, no, here's my truth. Well, it's never your truth, it's the truth of what God shows you through the Holy Spirit. Always let the Holy Spirit lead you. Try to get your, you know, you can use your brain to get in there and read, but always let your heart lead you to what God wants to show you, the truth the real truth that's in that book. Because sometimes it can get distorted. And you take, people take sometimes the scripture out of context and they use it for their own benefit. I've seen that many times. Because if you stay in the truth and you stay in that maturity and you keep mo moving forward to the conformity of Christ and you're continually growing and you're deepening maturity, you will be blessed and you'll be a blessing to others around you, right? The third level is rejoicing in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, so through whom we now have received the reconciliation. So again here, Paul, as he frequently does, as we've seen Paul do, he reminds us this, that everything that comes to us, right? Everything that comes to us comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that this morning? Everything that comes through you, through your life, in whatever aspect that is, that, you know, if it, comes, if it comes in a way that you might not understand it, just give it up to the Lord and say, thank you, Lord, I know you're showing me the way. I know you're showing me the path. It's coming through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Christ is the way to God. It's always that way. There is no other way. Because remember, and this scripture is powerful, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to God. You see, you get, you know, I've had friends hang up the phone on me or, or not want to talk to me anymore when I said this, there's only one way. Good friends, good friends, hang up the phones. It never, the people that I've known for many years, when I take them, I say, but Jesus is the only way, and I give them that scripture. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Hey, I don't want to contradict Jesus, first of all, number one. I believe what he's saying here. No one comes to God, no one comes to the truth, unless it's through Christ Jesus. Because it's Jesus who reveals the Father. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? It's Jesus who reveals the Father. Remember how John began the gospel? Look, John chapter 1, verse 1. And John chapter 1, verse 14, he says, In the beginning was the Word. Remember we talked about it a couple weeks ago. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's pretty self-explanatory. And we behold His glory, glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That is the way we see God. See, that scripture, that scripture, that's not me. That's the way we see God. When we see the greatness of Jesus, when you see the greatness of Jesus, we see the greatness of God. Do you believe that? When we see the greatness of Jesus, well, Jesus in your life, that's God in your life too. That's the greatness of God. And when we see and know the love of Jesus, which I think is very, very important, right? So you know that Jesus loves you. When you see and know the love of Jesus, you know the heart of God. We're to rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you do that? Oh, okay, well, how do you see the greatness of Christ? Paul says it's by understanding. Okay, here we go. It's by understanding the reconciliation. That word. From verse 12 of Romans 5 to the end of the chapter is a record of the greatness of Christ. That's what you see in these verses that we're in this morning. What Paul calls the reconciliation. And this passage, and I think I've said this a couple times already, not just about this passage, but this passage is probably what we're going through here. 
This passage is probably one of the most theologically important chapters in the Bible. I don't know if theology gets on track with you, but it probably is one of the most theologically important chapters in the Bible. It's, it's complicated. It's kind of a complicated statement what you're reading in here, in some ways, in some ways. But it's, I think it's tremendously important, though, this word reconciliation. And in this passage, it's, the clearest statement is this. In the Bible, is, remember what was called original sin? You've heard that expression, original sin, right? That has been, how has original, original sin been passed on to you and I? This, this, not just you and I, the whole human race, right? It's been passed on to us, uh, and like I said, the whole human race as a result of what? As a result of the sin of Adam. So, oh, okay, now we're bringing Adam into the picture here. Adam, the father of all the humans walking around this earth right now. And through this passage, Adam will say, as an individual, if you will, is what, what, he, what we see here, Paul contrasts, he, takes a, he contrasts and compares with the person of Lord Jesus. He's taken Adam and he's going to contrast and compare him to Jesus. He's going to put him up there and, and compare them. So you and I can see what has transpired and how they're different, right? So this section we're in here, it lays kind of the groundwork for Paul, for, and this is important, this section here is laying the groundwork for going forward in the book of Romans, for especially chapter 6, 7, and 8. So as you go forward in chapter 6, 7, and 8, Paul is kind of laying the groundwork for those chapters, for those verses that we're going to be going through, and they're going to be excellent verses. Oh, I can't wait to get to them. So it's really, really an important passage here. The main point that Paul wants to make here is this. The greatness, if you, let, if you hear anything this morning, Take this to your heart this morning. The greatness and the glory of the Lord Jesus. That's who you worship. That's who we sang to this morning. And the greatness and the glory of our Lord Jesus. So let me summarize it for you real quick. There are four parts in this section. Right? Verses 12 to 14. If you look at verses 12 to 14, Paul begins with us in Adam. You and I in Adam where we start as the human race, where everything began, right? The Garden of Eden, that's where everything began. I hope you believe that, right? And then in verses 15 to 17, he gives us a parallel. He kind of gives us, and it's a great parallel, because it's what we are brought to, you and I, human race, we're brought to, if, if we are in Jesus Christ. And as I said before, as he contrasts this and what we were in Adam before, because what we were in Adam and what we now are in Christ are two different things. Amen? You believe that, right? And then in verses 18 and 19, he gives a brief summary of this truth by the Apostle Paul. He, the chapter closes kind of with this, this like, I kind of say a brief explanation, because sometimes Paul's not too brief, of the relationship to the law. But he, he, he does it in a way, it's very quick at the end of the chapter. And then verses 20 to 21, he starts... That's basically when he's going through the law. That's verses 20 to 21. And so let us start with verse 12. Let's look at verse 12 real quick. Where will you begin in Adam? He says this in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world. Look at verse 12. There, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. See, there it is. That one man entered through the world. That's Adam. And death through sin, right? Because once Adam committed that sin, that was it. We were all destined to die. That sin came into the world. Then he goes on and says, in this way, death came to all men, which is true, right? Because all sin. We've talked about that before in the previous chapters. That's, that's, chapter, that's Romans chapter 12, uh, 5, verse 12. So Paul's make, what he's doing here, he's making a comparison. He says, he's making this argument, and he starts with two and they're undeniable, indisputable facts. He says, the universe, universality of sin. Sin is, is universal. When Adam, when Adam took, that bite, took that bite from Eve, when she gave that to him, sin came into the world. The whole world. It's universal. I don't care, I don't care if whoever you are. You are a sinner born into this world. The un, you can't deny that. Right? We've all, we've all, we probably all know this already. And there's evidence upon evidence that this, that he says is true, that we are... In, I know a lot of people want to be victims these days, but he says we're victims of the evils of sin and death. See, you were, we were victims. We, were, we weren't there 
it with Adam in the garden. We were just the victims of his sin. That's all it was. And the fact remains this, that it's clear evidence. And you always want to have evidence, right? We see evidence all the time in the Bible. It tells us all these things. As a matter of fact, you want to talk about evidence. Did you see this week um, the Israel, I forget the exact, the specific name of it, but it's a board of antiquities. And they were, and a lot of archaeology in Israel tells us the story of the Bible, to how true it is. And they found the pool of Siloam. The actual pool, and they, they were just having an excavation. They were just doing some construction work, and this one guy who was doing construction, he found like a, a steps, and they slowly, obviously, they stopped the construction. And now, the pool where Jesus healed, right? Where they all used to run and wait for the stir of the water, and they used to, and where Jesus healed, that's open to the public now. So there you have, that's, I think that's awesome, right? But we're talking about things here that is true and that are real, right? But wherever we look in the human race, right? Wherever you look in this, and you guys, I think, would attest to this, that wherever you look in the human race, where all around us, even people we know, right? That something's gone wrong with all of you. There's something wrong with humanity. Isn't it true? Otherwise, we'd be all walking around great. We would be all walking around blessed and loving and hugging. And well, we're not, we don't do that, do we? I mean, we do to an extent, but humanity, we look around, there's something wrong. And you, you really can't deny it. Well, you, well, I don't care whether you want to call it darkness, you want to call it, well, that's the fate of... No, I, 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 some kind of twist has come into, into this the human race, if you will. Something that you and I, we probably, we, we try to explain it. Well, you know, he, he didn't have a, a good education or he didn't have a good family or this or that. The other. You, can't, you can't explain the original sin to someone because that's where it all starts. And there's something just, it's something that's just tainted. We're a tainted world because of what happened in the garden. with Adam. And that makes, that makes people, you know what that does? It makes people act irrational. You know that. Right? And some that even, some people that we even know that something is wrong or hurtful, and sometimes you ever go, you know something is wrong or hurtful. How about take yourself for an example? And you know something deep in your heart, you're going to maybe say something, and you know it's going to be hurtful to someone, and you do it anyway. Right? You do it because you just can't hold yourself back. You spout it out, and you say it. Right? It's almost like you want to do it. That's, that's all, you know what that is? That all comes back from, from really the beginning of sin with Adam. But here Jesus saves us from those things, right? That is what's called original sin. That's what I'm talking about. And it's the only, sometimes it's just, hey, how about this parents? It's not only just evident in adults, is it? It's evidence in the kids, right? In children, right? You can see those, those, those little kids sometimes are the worst sinners. <laughs> we say, whoa, you, you got a smart mouth or you got this. Where'd they learn that from? That's, that's Adam. That's original sin. So, and see, and you can even go through, well, I won't even go into any doctrinal thing in other religions, but, and that's, that's an amazing thing that, just, that we're just kind of, we're born with that. And I think you're getting that already. And say, and Paul says this, here's what he's saying by this in the scriptures. He's saying, by one man, sin entered the world. By one man. By one man, sin entered the world. And then along with sin came what? Death. That's what happened. Along with sin came death, because you and I are born to die. We're going to die once, praise the Lord, once. That's the story. That's really the story. And later on in this passage, Paul says, death reigned. He says, death reigned. And then later on, he says, sin reigns. And in these two forces, because they are powerful forces, right? Death, right, as much as we don't want to think about it, and sin, they're powerful forces that have been in, that are in, that are in, all around us right now. Sin and death. Paul answers this. He's how did that sin and death get in it? through one man? And that's who it is. We're talking about Adam here, right? He's contrasting. And he's going to contrast here now, as we go forward here, two men, Adam and Jesus. So I think you want to hear more about Jesus here, right? And in either case, and that what comes to us. And, and that comes from that one man, either Adam or Jesus. So it's which one, right? It's through Adam that sin and death comes. It grips our race. It's who we are. We sin because we are sons and daughters of Adam. That's why you sin. And we die because we are sons and daughters of Adam. Paul traces that reign of sin and death back to Adam. And here's his argument in 13 and 14, verses 13 and 14. He says, before the law was given, sin was in the world. See, there it is. That's interesting. Before the law, sin was, 
in the world. But sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned, there it is, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come, meaning Jesus. So Paul's argument is this, simply, death, here it is, death is a punishment for you and I. Death is the punishment, not followers of Jesus, though. Death is a punishment for breaking a command. That's what it is. And in the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam, do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of evil in the day that you eat, therefore you shall surely die. And what did he do? Adam breaks that specific clear-cut rule and he eats the fruit. Adam eventually, actually, he, he well, here's what Adam does. He, and maybe you can relate to this. Adam decides to be independent. He decides, uh, even though God gave us all this beautiful garden and all this, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to become independent. I'm going to be my own God. That's basically what he's saying. He's, what he's doing, Adam, he's denying his dependence. And I pray you never do this. He de he's denying his dependence upon the God who made him. Wow, that's pretty. Man, I don't know if you've ever been through that. He's denying the dependence on the God who made him. It was, act of, it was an act of rebellion. It was an act of rebellion. It was an act of idolatry. He was, he was enthroning himself, basically. I bet you never thought of that about Adam. He was enthroning himself uh, as a god in the place of God. I think sometimes when around people around us, they think, you know, they got it all going on. They're like, like their, own, their own gods. They're almost like their own gods. They may not think that, but that's kind of how God looks at it. See, Adam broke that command, and as a result, death and sin were passed on to all of us, including all of us. And Paul is saying that this death is a result of breaking that command in order to have death. So here, Paul's conclusion is this, that the whole race actually sinned when Adam sinned. And we're tied, we're all tied together. And I think you guys are all getting that, right? Whether you understand it or not, sometimes it's kind of a big picture to understand. And that passage tells us, this passage tells us, and it reveals the fact that when Adam sins, he pushed the whole race, the whole race went into disaster. Right? Because we're all born with that sin at work in us. So he goes on and he goes on to talk about, he goes on now to show us how Adam is kind of a picture of Christ, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. Right? He, he, he comes to this point where he contrasts Jesus and Adam. Right? The two, one man brings sin into the world and one man takes sin out of the world. So let's take these verses, we'll go one at a time here again. And he says, look, look at verse 15, he says, but the gift is not like the trespass. And there is the gift. The gift, here, the gift of what all of us is always looking for, right? What, we're always kind of looking for something, right, in this life. We're always kind of searching for something. That gift that we're looking for is the gift of righteousness, is what we just talked about. That's what God's given us. This, Jesus has given us this gift of righteousness that you can stand before God, like I said before in the beginning. And the sense of worth, right? The sense of worth that you can have about yourself that, and the sense of significance. God gives us all the sense of worth and the sense of significance. And even in times when we're feeling down about ourselves and kind of tearing ourselves apart, right? God says, no, no, no. Before you stand in faith in Christ, you have the righteousness now to stand before God. And you have a sense of worth. You're somebody different. You're different than the human race. You're different than anyone else, anyone else walking around this earth. That's what righteousness means. And it comes as a gift from the Lord. Do you believe it this morning? It's a gift from the Lord. And this, the trespass, right, the sin, is Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. So Paul keeps, goes on, and he talks about we only, die in, we only die once, right? And he says, and Adam brought this death to us. But Jesus, here we go, Jesus brought ever-growing life and the experience of life going through. Jesus brings, I don't know how, if you feel this in your heart sometimes, that when you're really kind of like maybe slugging through, slug, you know, slugging through this life and you lift up and you say, Lord, you got to help me. And he gives you, I pray he does this and I pray you believe this, that he lifts you up sometimes when you can't even, you can't even take another step, right? That's not Adam, that's Jesus, right? Would you, I pray this, that you take life, do you take this life that you have every day, and this life from Jesus, and even you can do that a thousand times a day, this life that Jesus, this life giving, that you know when you take your last breath and you're out of here, that you're going to be with the Lord. That's life giving. I don't know if you really believe that or you have that in your heart, that when things are really tough, look up. Look up because 
You have life from Jesus Christ, and you can take that a thousand times a day. You can take that gift over and have that self-worth about who you are in Christ, no matter what anybody says about you. You can take that gift over and over and over and over again. It never gets old. It never gets old. Because whenever your spirit, and whenever your spirit is feeling down, right, or crushed, have you ever been there where you've been crushed or feeling down or insignificant or, or inadequate? Yeah, nobody ever feels that way, right? We're all perfect. No, 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 it's not true, right? Or insecure. Have you ever felt insecure? We can be renewed. That's beautiful. That's an awesome thing. You can be renewed. We can take life again. We can take that gift of life that Jesus gives us and that righteousness from him. That's an awesome thing because Christ is greater than Adam. That's the key. That or through the sin of Adam brought death once and the sacrifice of the death of Jesus brings life a thousand times. Look at verse 16. He says, and again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. I told you this is a difficult passage. <laughs> it really is. See, Adam's sin brought in judgment. That's what happened. Adam's sin, brought, Adam's sin once and brought death to all of us. Jesus died once and despite a thousand of sins, brought justification. Remember that word again. You're justified. You're justification to all that are in him. Praise the Lord. Amen this morning. That's the contrast. See, there's the contrast. Adam sinned once, brought death to all. Jesus died once and brought life despite thousands of trespasses or sins. That's the contrast. I'll say it again. Adam sinned once and brought death to all. Your Savior, my Savior, Jesus died once and brought life despite thousands of sins that you're going to commit and I'm going to commit and we're going to commit that we have committed, committing right now, committing going forward. What Paul's saying here is this. One trespass, one sin brought death. The death of Jesus brought the forgiveness for thousands of sins. All your life, all your life, my life, us, as many times as we're going to sin, you can't out -sin the grace of God. How about that? Can you th think about that? You can't out -sin the grace of God. So when you're feeling like, I'm done, I'm finished, God says, stop it. I took care of this at the cross. Stop it. Stand up. Come on. Tell people the truth. Your sins are forgiven. I know, I want you to repent. I don't want you to keep sinning, but that's the Holy Spirit's work will do that. That'll, the Holy Spirit will take care of that part for you, by the way, the conviction part. So no matter, no matter how many sins, and I know that sometimes this is hard for us to grasp. It really is. And I think I probably have a, my list probably could fill these, both of these, maybe even all around these worlds, the sins in my life. No matter how many sins are involved in your, let's say, record, if you want to say, your record, there's freedom. There's freedom in Christ. That's an awesome thing. If you take out it, don't be down on yourself. Man, maybe you've, got, maybe you've, gone, maybe you've had a couple, a couple of hard days. Maybe you said things, or maybe you did some deeds that you weren't too proud of this week, or, or you got involved in something you shouldn't have got involved in. You know what? Lift it up to the Lord, because God's grace is there. And no matter how many trespasses, there's freedom in Christ and forgiveness. See, there it is. Forgiveness. 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 Forgiveness in all of them. I know sometimes we, and you know what? I've seen, I know some people that have some of the things they've done. I, I, I have a hard time forgiving <laughs> forgiveness sometimes. But the grace of God is, is, is awesome. So you say, well, how? Well, what about someone who does this? Or what about someone this heinous thing? Man, if they come to Christ, God forgives them. Sometimes it's hard to struggle with. Let's look at verse 17 as we keep going forward here. For if we trespass above one man, one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in his life? Through the one man, Jesus Christ. There it is. Verse 17. So Paul's argument here again is Adam's transgression, his sin, his permitted sin to reign over the whole race, which we talked about. Not only does death come to us at the end of our life because of Adam, because that's why you die. That's why you physically die, because of what, what Adam did. But it reigns throughout our life. I mean, it, it tries to creep in our life all the time. And Paul's talking about 
And I don't know if I, if I can say this correctly here. He, Paul's talking here about forms of death. See, death is sometimes, death is not just like a physical death. Have you ever felt like someone said, well, I feel dead in my spirit. I feel dead in my self. I feel, you ever hear someone ever say something like that? Like, I feel dead in my feelings. I, 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 I you know, um, I think sometimes I've felt that in my life where I felt dead in my spirit. Gone to that. He's talking, he's not just talking about physical death here right now, Paul. He's not just talking about the cessation of life, if you will. So, and you say, well, well, then what is life? What are we talking about here? Well, what is life to you? What is life to you? Isn't life, isn't life love, right? Isn't everybody want to be loved? I mean, that, say, love, is, love is the most powerful thing, I think, especially for a Christian. The love of Christ has given me the opportunity to relate to people that I don't even want to relate to. Has that ever happened to you? Or, or joy. How about joy in your life? Do you want joy in your life? How about, how about excitement? You want excitement in your life? I think we all like that, right? Like excitement. Like, you know, that vitality of, and, and having a, 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 a fulfillment, being fulfilled in all the things that you do. And I know that's hard sometimes, right? That's life. That's what kind of, that's kind of some of the uh, a summary of kind of some of the things we want out of life, right? That vitality, the having uh, fulfillment in this life. Death, death is this. De death is the absence of life. And I've seen people walk around with a deathly look on the absence of life in them. I have seen people like that. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when I see that. Because death, that death is like, when you see people like that, when you see people are going through and you kind of like look at them and they're just like, Shh, no, that's an empty, they have an emptiness, a deep emptiness inside of them. Hey, I've had that. They've had the loneliness they have a loneliness, a misery, depression, restlessness. Uh, those things are all like, that's, that's kind of a, like a death, not overcoming you, but it kind of takes the life out of you, right? Doesn't depression take the life out of you? Doesn't misery take the life out of you sometimes? Loneliness. How much of, how much of your life is made up of death? Think about it. Really, it, it, I, I mean that, not the cessation of life, but some of the things that we just were saying here. A lot of it, right? Sometimes, a lot of it sometimes. Death reigns, because, that reigns because of Adam's transgression. That Adam, oh, I guess we'll see him in heaven one day. Would you want to question him about something? <laughs> say, Adam, why'd you do that? Yeah, I don't think you'll say that to him. Paul's saying here that Christ's death provides abundant grace. That's what he's saying. It, it provides... And it's an awesome thing if you really grasp this in your heart this morning. Christ's death provides abundant grace and loving acceptance. You're accepted and loved by Christ because of God's unmerited favor upon you, the gift he's given you, Jesus Christ our Lord, which is available again and again and again to all of us, that we can reign in life, not in death, as we come to the end here. You can... And I pray this for you. I pray this for me too. I have to be honest. You can have life, live this life in the midst of all these pressures that we have. And we all do. We all have different pressures. We all do. You can live this life in the midst of all these pressures that we have and all the circumstances that we go through and all the suffering we go through and all the troubles that we go through. I'm just being real here. Your spirit can be alive and joyful. Plug those two together. Your spirit experiencing fulfillment and delight. To having some type of being fulfilled. Not in just who you are, but who you are in Christ. Because we live in life now, right? We do. Right? Love, joy. We talk about love, joy, peace, happiness, glory, gladness. All these different things. They fill our hearts. We pray that. And even in the middle sometimes of our heartaches, right? Even in the middle of our heartaches and the pressures of life, Paul is drawing this parallel so that this, we might see how much more we have in Jesus than we ever had in Adam. So there is the contrast. What we have in Jesus, we could never have in Adam. Thank the Lord. What we lost in Adam, we regain in Jesus. If that makes sense to you. I know it's theological, you have to kind of grasp onto this, but I'm just trying to make it simple because I'm kind of a simple person. So let me finish here in verses 18 and 19. Because here's a summary of the truth. 
He says, consequently, just as a result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all men. Paul is saying this, that death or judgment or condemnation comes to us not because of our own sin, but because of Adam's. It's from Adam's. I think you're getting that. And he says this, the gift from the Lord and so much that we desperately crave, crave and need, we, we need to accept that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Amen? And we can have all we need. And I pray this. We all can have all we need in any time you need it. Right? It says here, for just, verse 19, For just as though the disobedience of one man, right, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, meaning Jesus, that many will be made righteous. Praise the Lord. Amen. And here, that's just plain what that's saying. What that scripture is saying there is saying that this, that we are made righteous in Christ. And that's how I'm going to end it. You're made righteous in Christ. It's a gift from the Lord. Take it. Run with it. Go with it. Tell other people about your gift. Tell people about your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, especially in the world we're in today. There's a lot of lost hope in this world. There's a lot of desperation. There's a lot of, there's a lot of misery. There is a lot of pain. There's a lot of sorrow in this world right now. And I'm not, that's not being negative. That's just being truthful. You know, we can walk around and just kind of slough it off, but you got to keep your eyes and ears open because Christ has put you in a position, right, that spiritual position where you can bring people that hope that you once didn't have, which is an awesome thing. Do you agree? You, you say, can you say amen? I can say amen on that. So here, men, you want to pass out the elements? We're going to have communion this morning. I, I, as I end here, I'll make it, I don't want to make it simple, but it is. Only Christ can set you free. Only Christ can set you free. You may think there's all kinds of different ways. Because sin and death will never lose their hold in a filthy, it's a filthy hold, sin and death, on us except through the Lord and the command of Jesus Christ, the one to whom we look to is our Lord Jesus. Amen? And I, I say this, and I say this very, again, very, very simply. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Lord, our King. As we, and as we see him, and when you see Jesus in the scriptures, when you see him in the scriptures, and you see what Jesus has said in those scriptures, he pours out his strength to us, and that purity, and that wisdom, and power to us, to his, and all that is available to us. And that's, I, I, I urge you guys, take everything that God has given us and use it. Use it, for, use it for the kingdom. Use it for the kingdom. Use it for your family. Use it for your neighbors. Use it for your enemies. Use it for your enemies. Thanks, brother. We rejoice through our, we rejoice through our Lord Jesus Christ and that he's always, and I pray this that you always know this, he's available to us. So I hear, as you know, this ending here, that, that's the end of chapter 5. And here, just real quick, justification, we see this, justification through faith in Jesus. Christ takes away our guilt, right? And so he makes that way for peace in our life, and he gives access to us in the wondrous grace of God, amen. And through Christ alone, Christ alone, the believer, you and I, we come into fullness of joy. I pray you know this in your heart. You being saved this, you're saved from wrath. You're saved from wrath in his love. Not just going to heaven, but triumphantly going to heaven. I like that, triumphantly going to heaven. Because the, the, when Jesus died for you and for me and for us, as we celebrate, we're going to celebrate this morning, because that's what communion is, right? It's a celebration. I believe in my heart that's what it is, because Jesus said, remember me. And it's a celebration of what Jesus did when he walked this earth and or some, it's what Jesus did, some of the things we all talked about this morning, that the celebration, that we remember these things, we remember, we remember, we remember by reading the book, right? We remember by reading a good book and by having those things be written in our heart and in our spirit. And we remember what, that Jesus, what? That Jesus was crucified, he died, and he was buried, and that he was resurrected. Then he ascended to the Father. That was, that's what we remember, right, this morning? That the dying Jesus laid the foundation satisfying for sin and the living Jesus perfects that work in you right now. The living work, of, the work that is in you 
That's the living Jesus in you. The things that you think about, the things you say, the things how you interact. That's the living Christ, the living. That's what I remember now. I remember that. Thank you, Lord, for changing me, for making me, for molding me, for bringing me to a a new position, because that's a spiritual position that you never had before. I remember that, Lord. Thank you for that. And that saved, that when Jesus, by his death, he saves us from the penalty, right? That power from the power of sin from Adam, right? That here the scripture tells us so awesomely, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. There it is. And have entered eternal, I have eternal life. For God did not send his only son into the world to condemn. What did he do? He says, he's, in order that the world might be saved. There it is. Saved from what? From that sin we were just talking about, Adam's sin. So when we remember these things, and I always think of Jesus when he, and I'll ask you this, I don't know how everybody out there right now, and communion is for Christians, right? If you're a follower of Jesus, because that's what Jesus said, right? He told, he told his disciples, do these things, remember me, right? They were followers of Jesus, just like we are followers of Jesus. So if you're thinking, or you've been going down this road, and maybe you're maybe unsure who you are in Christ, come to Jesus right now. Come to Christ right now, because you know what? I'm not saying it's, you know, uh, a simple thing, but it's a heart thing. Let your heart go. You know, you've probably been fighting. Some of us, sometimes we fight. We're always fighting. And we want to we wanna have our own way of thinking. We want to have our own way of doing things. We want to have our own way, our own say, right? And a lot of times in this life. And so that's okay. That's good. We have certain freedoms. But you know what God says? He, God says, follow me. Jesus says, follow me. And if, that, if that's you this morning, if you're in a place where you want a relationship with Jesus, here's what Jesus says. Come. Come to me. Turn away from your sin. Turn, turn away from your sin and come to me. And believe. Believe in, believe in me and who I am and who I said I was and what I did when I walked this earth. That I was, I was crucified for you. That I was buried and then I was resurrected and I came to life and conquered death. Ah, he conquered death. If you want that relationship, just believe. Say that in your heart. Just, you know what? People say it was a sinner's prayer and all that. You know what? Take time. Take your time. Think about this. And just give your heart over to Christ. And you, you can have a relationship with him. And then, you know what? You can partake and be a, in, in the family. And if that's you this morning, I pray that. If you want to go into our website, ccberkeley.org, if you need a Bible, we'll send you one. You could go on there, put your phone number in. If you need a phone call, you want to talk about salvation, I'd love to do it. And that's why we remember Christ this morning. So Jesus, as he goes in this, this time before his followers, if you will, this, this night before his crucifixion, he has this last supper, and he's really, and I know deep probably, if, just like we would, knowing if we were going to face someone and we're with our families, we probably would be looking around and go, would they remember me when I'm gone? When we, would they remember me? And I always tell the story, because I always think that's kind of important, you know, <laughs> you, whenever you go through something, you want to remember the good things, right? Boy, I'll tell you what, when Jesus says, remember me, I want to remember what he did for me. And I always remember this. It always struck me this way because when my m mother passed away, she left, and I told the story before, and it's always kind of always struck with me. She left a little note in one of her jewelry boxes, and she opened, Debbie opened up the box and just said, you know what it said in there? It said two words, remember me. That's what it said. But that was, see, that was important. That was important to my mother that Debbie would remember, remember her. Like, all the, because they had a relationship for many, many years. And I, I, I in, in to this day, I mean, I know, I know my wife, she, she remembers my mother because she can cook a good batch of spaghetti sauce. She's good. So remember, remember, that's what Jesus is saying here. Remember me. And before we do, before we take communion, let me ask you this. Don't come to this. And we say we have sup with the Lord, right? We sup with the Lord. We come with the Lord this morning. Don't come with a grudge on your heart right now. Because that, that wouldn't be right. Don't come, if you got, if right now, and we're going to take a minute, if you really want to, maybe if you got something against someone right now, maybe you got a heart, your heart's a little hard right now, maybe you've just gone through, maybe right now you, your relationships are not going too well. You know what? Give it up to the Lord. Before you come to the table, give those things up to the Lord. Let's take, let's take a second, let's bow our heads. Before we take the cup, we take the bread, let's just, Let's just get, you know what? If there's something on your heart right now, just give it up to the Lord right now. Go ahead. Come on now. Let your heart go. 
Yeah, I know all of us got something. But Jesus is right there. We'll come to the table in joy this morning and honor him and all we do and all we say. But man, let's purify ourselves. Let's purify your heart this morning before you come to Christ. Because like I said, a thousand times, two thousand times sin, whatever it is, God forgives us. Repent, turn away. And he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, he says, And through him, here's the word again, here it is, look, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's what we celebrate this morning. All the things here on earth are heaven by making peace to what? To Jesus, the blood on the cross. We remember. And he says, in the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's take the cup. Well, I'll say this. It may seem like sometimes, you know, we do this once. We try to do it. We do, we do this once a month. But you can have communion every day, right? If you want, with the Lord. That's a good thing. What I'm saying is, remember him every day this week. Every minute, every hour. I know we're going to get flooded with life in general and all that stuff. But when things get, when things get all befuddled, Think of the Lord. He'll help you out. He'll get you through it. For our wrestling is not against blood and flesh, but against the principalities, against powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual hosts of evil in the heavenly places. Now the devil is the enemy of every believer and there is a demonic world around us today and it's manifesting itself at the present hour. wickedness and the deceit and the lying and the cunning and the murder and the rape and the pillaging and all of that that Satan can bring down upon mankind. Grace raised us above it. Righteousness is greater than it. And all of these graces come forth from God the Father to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. says is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers the powers the world forces of this darkness the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places and the scripture says therefore take up the full armor of God the belt Paul said having your loins girt with truth in other words learn the scriptures learn the word of God this is how we resist the devil and then Paul said 
put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate was made of bronze backed with tough pieces of hide. And the breastplate of righteousness is what we get from Jesus Christ when we come to him as our Lord and Savior. Because our righteousness, our goodness is filthy rags in the sight of God. And we receive the breastplate of righteousness so that when the devil shoots his fiery darts, they can't penetrate that breastplate. And then thirdly, he says, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It means that you should have the peace of God in your heart. The serenity, the joy, the happiness that Christ gives should be in your heart so that when troubles come, Satan will not be able to get close to you. And then fourthly, the Roman soldiers carried a shield. The scripture says, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Satan is always shooting his missiles and his darts at us. We need the shield of faith. Intellectually, you cannot come to Christ alone because your mind has a veil over it put there by the devil. But when you come to Christ, your mind is illuminated by the Holy Spirit and the things that you didn't understand before, you now accept by faith and you put on that helmet, and that helmet protects you against the enemy. And then there's the sword, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the offensive weapon. And the scripture says that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus used the sword, the Word of God. And then the seventh and the last thing is to pray. Pray without ceasing, said Paul. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Check your armor. Is it in place?